Right, okay, well, hello, people watching. Um, myself and Yaron were due to do an event at, uh, was it King's College London? King's College yeah. London. yeah. Um, but we, we had some troublemakers. <laughs> they weren't that much of a... <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> they weren't that much trouble, but the, the administration got a bit sketchy and uh, skittish, and so we've found another venue. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience, everyone, by the way. Um, so, Yaron, we were, we, were, we were due to speak about objectivism. Yes, yes. Looking forward to speaking about objectivism. Right, okay. Before Antifa interrupted us. So. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, this is going to be awkward because I haven't got the correct recording equipment either. Um, right, okay. So, I want to talk about the moral foundations of objectivism. So, um, would you like to give us a quick rundown? <laughs> Just cold, like that. Just cold. <laughs> well, I mean, the, 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 the idea is it's egoism, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's egoism. It's a question of what, you, what you're really asking. Are you asking what is the ethics of objectivism? Yes. Or, or, or are you asking kind of the, the, the meta ethics? Where does it come from? Because that's harder. Um, and we can, we can talk the, about that as well. The, the basic ethics. But let's talk about the basic ethics. The basic ethics is that your life is the standard of value. If morality as a science is, is supposed to give you guidance about which values to pursue in life, what is right and what is wrong, what is the right path? in life and what is the wrong path in life. Objectivism argues that the guide, the standard by which you decide what is right and what is wrong, what is a good path, what is a bad path, is your life. Your survival and ultimately your survival qua human being and what that means, the qua human being, is as a rational being, as a rational animal. So what is good for you as a rational human being is what is good. What is a threat, we experience that today, what is a threat to your life as a <laughs> rational human being yeah. is evil, is bad. And, and those are the categories. And now objectivism says, okay, once you have that, then it's a scientific question. What leads to human flourishing? What leads to individual success? What leads to good life? What leads to survival and prospering? And what leads to destruction and death and, 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 and bad stuff and misery and depression and everything else? And, if, if, if we identify the things that lead to a good life, those are your values. And, and the things to are avoided are those that lead to a bad life. So it's, it's fairly simple once you accept the principle that your life, not the group, not the collective, not the tribe, not even your friends, not even your mother, not even your family, your life is the standard by which everything else is evaluated. So, I mean, this, this seems like the ultimate ethical standard of individualism to me. Like the, the final possible one, because uh, one, one thing that um, Peikoff uh, talks about often is uh, the comparison between uh, the ethics of egoism compared to the ethics of altruism. Um, would you like to tell us a bit about the ethic of altruism? Yes, the, the ethic of altruism basically sets out that your purpose in life is other people's well-being. Not just that you help other people, not just that you open doors and are polite and nice. The whole point of your life, your moral purpose in life, is the well-being of others. And you are good to the extent that you're willing to sacrifice your life, to sacrifice your values for the sake of others. Now, who are these others? Fill in the blank, right? And, and, and you know, the Nazis are going to pick theirs, as Dr. Peikoff talks about in the book. Communists are going to pick the proletarian. Uh, the, 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 you know, the racists are going to say the, the, your white little thing or whatever their culture is. It's, it's some group out there, but it's not you. And indeed, if you, if you read the real altruists, if you read uh, Augustine Comte, the French philosopher in the 19th century, or even Immanuel Kant, uh, who really, I think, really secularizes this approach, and we could talk about the fact that this approach is fundamentally Christian, but, but it, Kant secularizes this approach. And what Kant says is, if, if you meet a happy person, you should be a little suspicious. Because happiness is achieved through thinking about yourself. And we know that thinking about yourself and, 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 and pursuing your own self-interest is evil. You know, somebody happy, suspicious. He also says, if you, in pursuit of helping somebody else, let's say, you know, you fall down and I come and help you up. If I, when I went to help you up, thought for a minute, oh, I'm going to feel good about helping call out, right? He's a good guy. I'm going to feel good about myself. Uh, not a moral act. Because as soon as you bring yourself into the motivation of it, you take it out of the realm of morality. So they are true altruists in the sense that you have to have this pure 
selfless motivation, your interests, your emotions, your values, what you think should never enter into the equation. You should be, in a sense, the servant, the slave of the other, fill in the blank, who that happens yeah, to be. That, that's really interesting, actually, because <clears throat> like, uh, I, I think that, I mean, there's been an awful lot of work done by cognitive psychologists following in the sort of the line set by David Hume saying, re, you know, reason is the slave to the passions. It, I think um, the latest work by Jonathan Haidt is about as good as I think it's going to get. It's not quite like that, but it's pretty close. Um, but basically it means you can't really do anything that isn't self-interested. And if you actually think, right, could I, can you actually take an action for which you don't feel some kind of just, you know, you don't feel like you've done a, if you do a charitable act, you think, well, I'm a good person because I've done a charitable act. Well, you've identified your own self-interest. To do something that would be completely against your own interest would be irrational. It would look silly. You'd, you'd have to end up ruining yourself for no reason at all. You'd, like hacking off your own arm for no one's benefit. So, um, so I would disagree with the few... Yeah. With okay. a mul yeah, yeah. multiple levels yeah, yeah. of what you just said. Um, two things. I think people, I think 99% of people on the planet don't act in their own self interest. I think most people don't even think properly about what their self interest is. So I don't think self interest is whatever you feel like. I don't think whatever self interest means, whatever makes me feel good. I mean, there's, if there was a line of cocaine here, I mean, I know that sniffing it will make me feel good. I mean, there's no doubt, right? I would get a high. Is it in my self interest? That's a different question, and exactly, and that requires thinking, that requires consideration, that requires long-term planning, that, that requires taking into account the entirety of my life and what is the effect of this line of cocaine going to have on me. To me, that is what self-interest means. Self-interest means rational, long-term evaluation of this act is, in that context, is it good for me? I think very few people actually do that, but I would even say more than that. I know lots of people who do stuff that they know is bad for them. I know lots of people who do stuff that is sacrificial, that is against their self-interest. For example, I know lots of people who take the cocaine over and over and over again, knowing, rationally knowing, that it will destroy their lives, right? <laughs> and people, people act in self-destructive ways all the time. People get into relationships with people that they know are bad for them, and they, they won't break up, and they stick with those, well, so is, rationally is they know. Is it, is it worth determining, um, distinguishing between, say, immediate self-interest and long-term self-interest then? No, because then I think you're so. assuming, cause they, no, because then you're assuming that there's such a thing as short-term self-interest. I don't think there is. I think, I think there is. I, I think short-term self-interest, by definition, is what is in oh, It's mind. gratification of the passion, isn't it? Yeah, so there's, a, there's, there's worthwhile separating self-interest with gratification of passions. I don't think those two are the same at all. Indeed, I th and this is a key point in Rand's philosophy. The key point in Rand's philosophy is you, emotions are not tools of cognition. Emotions are not guides to action. Satisfying one's passion in and of itself is self-destructive, not self-interested. It usually leads down rabbit holes. And, and what you want, what you really want is to always be guided by reason and not negate your emotions. I mean, I'm a pretty emotional guy, right? But to identify your emotions, to recognize your emotions, to understand your emotions, and then if they're rational, to act on them. But then, you know, even I sometimes feel something and I go, why did I feel that? That's yeah. stupid. And then I think about it and, I, and I, hopefully I can undo it. I think, um, I think what you're talking, uh, speaking to is an ideal but I don't think that humans ever really reach that ideal. I mean, one of the, the there's an awful lot of cognitive psychology that shows that people do just literally follow their passions, and then their reason, uh, their their faculties, are basically acting like a lawyer after the fact. Why did I do this? Now I have to make up an excuse for why this has happened. So I, I think um, in a, in an ideal world, then yeah, absolutely. If people were a lot less emotional and able to fully rationalize their behavior before they take it. But I don't think that means that they don't act in their own immediate self-interest. It's just that's very short-sighted and, as you say, destructive. So, but, but also I think people do act altruistically. But, but let me just address this because I think it's important. Rand's morality is not descriptive. It is prescriptive. So it's not saying this is how people act. Of course they don't. And in that sense, if you, if you read Adam Smith's uh, Theory of Moral Sentiment, Adam Smith describes how people really act. And in that sense, he's not pres prescribing a morality, he's describing a morality. So he's not a moralist at all. He's not indeed a philosopher. What Ayn Rand is saying is, yeah, you all act in this way. Don't. There's a better way to act. 
So she's saying, yes, I, I, I mean, I don't want to put words in her mouth. I would say, yes, there are all these cognitive psychology issues. Learn from them. So you have a cognitive bias, correct it. You notice that you're following your emotions instead of being led by your mind, fix it. So what she is trying to do is provide us with a tool for living, not describing how everybody lives. That's boring. That's for, that's for, um, that, that's for psychologists and, and cognitive scientists to do. The question is, how can we live? What is the ideal? And that, what should we strive towards? And maybe, maybe we can't all, maybe in the world today, we can't all achieve 100% perfection. At, but what should be, where should we try to yeah, go yeah, to? The ideal is struggling to. Yes, the ideal that we're struggling to. And that's the role of philosophy. The, philosophy. the role of philosophy is not to describe the world as it is. The role of philosophy, particularly morality and on, epistemology and metaphysics is the world as it is and human nature and human cognition as it is. But when you start, when you start talking about morality and, and all the way to politics and even aesthetics, the role of philosophy to tell you how the world should be, what you should do to change yourself to become better at living, at being, at being a human being. Um, and look, even, even when it comes to the epistemological issues, you know, I have a lot of, I mean, I, I believe that our knowledge of psychology this relates to Jordan Peterson, or our knowledge of cognitive uh, sciences relating to David, uh, to David, to, to hate. Um, <laughs> it, these are young professions. We know very little in them, and I think there's a lot yet to be discovered. <laughs> I think Jonathan Haidt way over emphasizes the genetic makeup. So does so does Jordan Peterson and a lot of others. Kind of the, 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 the evolutionary biology, the conditioning, the genes, uh, versus none of them really talk about the role of free will and our own role in designing our own software, in setting our own path in life and how much that, that is. That, well, I, I, that's, that, I, I don't think you're fairly uh, representing Hyde there because he, he does say that this, that the problem is, is on one side you have the social constructivists who think that everyone's a blank slate and there's absolutely nothing and that's not true and we, we know that's not true and on the other side you have the genetic determinists who are just the opposite who think that there is no point yeah. to being a cognitive animal because yeah. eventually you're, you're gonna have to follow yes. your genetic programming neither of these are correct we, we, we know they're not correct um, and so my, my the reason okay no but, on, but I, I think that say. both parties if you think about that dichotomy yeah. the, the social constructivists think that you are determined by your environment mm -hmm. by other people what is missing from that picture? You've got genes here and you've got environment here. And to me, the most important factor in determining who you are and who I am is the third factor, which is me. Yeah, the the choices process. I make, the, the cognitive, but, but it's, 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 it's a cognitive process driven by a particular choice that we make. And, and Rand emphasizes that the essence of free will is not lifting my hand. That is not the, the essence of free will is the choice to focus your mind, to use your mind, to use your reason or not. And that's the essence, that's the, that's the core of what free will is. And most people who talk about psychology today, including Haidt, don't talk about that third element. And when they do talk about it, they still talk about it as, they, they, they really avoid this issue of free will as much as they can. I, 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 don't, think, I don't think he does. Um, I mean, he, he does talk about the, the fact that the, I mean, he uses the metaphor of the elephant and the rider, the elephant being your, your passion itself and the rider being your, your reasonable faculties and how they're constantly trying to make excuses. But that's not to say that they can't steer the elephant when necessary. He does, he does have data and goes into this. But, yep. um, but get, getting, getting to the, um, the, the thing I wanted to talk about. So, sure. Okay, so my, my the, the reason I don't consider myself to be an objectivist is because I think that altruistic ethics have evolved because human beings need one another. And until human beings don't need one another, I think there will always be a place for this. And I don't think that um, a purely uh, rational, egotistic, or egoistic uh, form of morality will... No, I mean, I don't think it's a suffice for me personally, but I also don't think it would suffice for the general population because I don't think most people will really be able to fully grasp what we're talking here. And I, I'm not trying to sound condescending, but like, if you think you're an average football fan, they're, they're not, I don't think they're ever going to get through Atlas Shrugged. You know? yeah, well, I, I, I'm not convinced, but uh, you know, take, take Greece. I, I truly believe that in ancient Greece, the idea of altruism by everybody, Plato, Aristotle, nobody would have accepted it. And if you think about Aristotle's ethics, it's about 
finding those virtues and values that promote your own your domineer, your own flourishing, your own success. But, but beyond that, um, this idea that ego is a means, I don't want you, I don't need you, I, I don't want to have anything to do with you, but you, you, you're kind of implying it. You said that you, we need human relations. Of course we need human yeah. relationships. It's, it's hugely in my self-interest yeah, what, what to mean engage is, in human relationship with other people. That, that's true. That's true. But I'm, I'm talking... Some people, anyway. I, I'm talking in, <clears throat> like, physically dependent ways. I mean, for example, you know, if, if you have uh, your mother and she's sick and she can't work and she needs, she needs money from you, yeah. you're going to have to do an altruistic thing and provide food and board for her. But really, so two, two options stay with my mother, right? Yeah. One is I love her. And if I love her, it's not altruism. I'm helping my mother because she's... Maybe you she's hate your mother. Option number two <laughs> yeah. is I hate my mother and then I'm not helping her. And, and I think it's completely legitimate and right and moral not to help her. So, so I mean, they're, they're I, parents, I disagree on that. There are parents who abuse their kids. I think it's in a massive sacrifice to help those parents. Those parents should be shunned. You should never speak to them again. You should walk away from them. You owe nothing to your parents. You didn't ask to come into this world. The, you know, if they mistreated you, then they violated a sacred contract that they have uh, with, with, with having a child, and they don't deserve one iota of help. So, um, I think, yes, if you love your mother, it's not altruistic. And if you don't love your mother, you shouldn't help your mother. Uh, and and, and, and I, think, I think this is exactly where people, to go back to the previous discussion, I think people actually do act against their self-interest. A lot of people help their mothers when their mothers don't deserve help. Some mothers should not be helped. Right, okay. I think, I think I've worked out um, what, what... I think I've worked something out. So, okay, so... The, the, the question is self-interest is, I guess, I, I guess the best way to describe it would be objectively defined? Yes, objectively defined. So, as in anyone can look at so, that chap over there and if you know, you know so, a few things about him, then you can determine his self-interest no. as objectively as he can? No, no, no. You'd have to know a lot about him. Well, yeah, right? yeah, sure. You'd have to know every little detail about him. Only you can really define right. so it's your subjective. objective. It's, no, it's objective. Objective in a sense that it corresponds to reality. See, objective is not that other people... Oh, you needed me to move this way? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, objective is not about, uh, you know, whether other people can do it for you. Objective means that it's rational, that it corresponds to the facts of reality out there. Yeah. So, so it, 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 you know, what, what self-interest means is taking into account everything you know about you, everything you know about the world, what is, in the long run, truly good for you. Yeah. Now, this is not materialistic. This is not about, well, make no, me no, the no, most I money. Wasn't, wasn't so if, if you love your mother, you want to help your mother. Yeah, if you love your friend, you want to help your friend. But you know, there, 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 there's certain people who come for me to help. The kid, you know, they're dying from cancer or whatever. And I'm going to say, absolutely not. You're, you're, you're an SOB and I'm not going to help you. And there are people who would come to me for help and I would give them everything I have because I love them and I care for them. And they're incredible value in my life. My wife, my kids, my, my best friends, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So, uh, you know, egoism does not mean isolation from other people. It does not mean help, not helping other people. It, does, it certainly does not mean not interacting with other people because, but it means interacting with other people in the way that benefits benefits you in the long run in, in the big picture thing. And that means uh, judging people. Who are my friends and who are my enemies? Who, who do I like, who I don't like, who do I want to associate, who I don't want to associate with? And, running, and, and managing your life, not based on what's good for them, but based on what's good for you, interacting with people that are good for you and not inter For example, you know, if, if, if you don't like your family, I tell this to young people all the time, if you don't like your family, if you really don't like them, if they do damage to your life, walk away. You owe them nothing, right? So if your parents are really destructive to your life, then, then move away. Now, my parents were not destructive to my life, but they, you know, but you know what? I, I didn't have to be with them constantly, so I moved 7,000 miles away. For parents who are pretty good, right? They're not, nothing wrong with my parents at all. And I, and I love them to, to, to some extent. So it, it's, it's, it's be, I mean, I do. I mean, but I love my wife a lot more, and I love my life much more than that. So, I'm, so I went not to be close to my parents. I moved 7,000 miles away because that was the place where I could make the most of my life. And, and being in touch with my, my siblings and my parents is somewhere in my higher care values. But you know what? It's not at the top because 
other things are, are more important to me. So I think um, the reason I couldn't call myself an objectivist is because of the definition of self-interest that's being used. Um, I see, I, I would define self-interest as being a lot um, closer to the nose. I, I don't think most people, when they're following their self-interest, are making long-term rational decisions. Because they're not following <clears throat> their self-interest. That would be my definition. Well, that's exactly. They're not following your definition of self-interest. What, what, what I'll call so immediate self-interest for, yeah. for, the, for, the, um, for the conversation. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I think people um, are almost forced to follow their immediate self-interest. I don't think they have much of a choice. So, and the, the reason that I, I don't necessarily ascribe to the definition of self-interest that you use. I mean, if we call that rational self-interest sure. versus immediate self-interest. Solid right? rational self-interest. Just, yeah. That's fine. Um, and so I, I can't really get on board with self-interest um, in the way that most people would understand it and the way I understand it being a moral decision because it's not a decision. So, so would you say, this is the question, right? From a prescription perspective, what would you advise a young person? Would you advise Why? the young person to be rationally self-interested. Absolutely. Well, then, then you well, agree. Well, I, I, I agree that you should look to your long-term future and understand that you're... And it's not, it's not just your own self-interest, though. That's the thing. It is also for other people. And the thing is, I think a lot of people need to do things for other people to feel like they are a, an actualized person, that they are actually doing something good in the world. I mean, I, I, some people do. And, and you know, in a, in a rational world, in an objectivist world, there would be social workers, right? There would be people that their profession would be, in a sense, to help other people. But again, it's because it, it enhances their lives, it, yeah, because absolutely. it's what interests them, it's what they're, it, it, they're interested in. How do, you, how do you get other people to be successful? So you work with other people to be successful. But, 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 but this is the point. Morality is about prescribing. Morality is not about describing. And the question is, would you prescribe to a young people to be rationally self-interested in this expansive sense that I've defined it, in a sense that everything should be evaluated based on what's good for you, but that includes you know, other people and it includes spiritual values and includes all these things that truly add up to what it means to have a flourishing, successful, long-term, happy life. I, I don't think you need to prescribe self-interest to people. That's the thing. I think um, really, I mean, may, maybe there are occasions where you can find someone who isn't self-interested, even, even if we make the distinction between rational self-interest and immediate self-interest. Yeah. I think it's very difficult to find someone who isn't in some way following their own self-interest. And I think that that's not really a choice. I think people pretty much have to do that. And I think that if you're not making a choice, I don't think you can really consider it to be moral. So forget, so forget the word self-interest. Put aside okay. the word self-interest okay. a minute, because I think it's creating cognitive okay. yeah. challenges here. Would you prescribe for people to be rational versus an alternative follow of their course. emotion? Of course. Well, and, and you think everybody is self-interested. So then the only thing to, to, to change... Well, they're not people, irrational beings. No, no, I know. But to, if you want to change the world, if you want to make the world a better place, would you tell people, you know, in pursuit of your self-interest, you should be rational? Well, I think everyone should be rational generally. Yeah. Even if they're not pursuing their own self-interest, they should still be rational. I think if you're rational, you're pursuing your self-interest, period. I think, I think. So for Ayn Rand, pursuing your self-interest means being rational. Right. So okay. for her, okay. the virtue that, that encompasses all other virtue is rationality. And the, the value, which is the, the, what you call the cardinal value, is reason. So rationality is the practice of yeah, reason, yeah, of if course, you will. Yeah. So for her, if you're prescribing to people be rational, you're basically prescribing to them be self-interested because that what's, well, that's what it means. And, and, and you're saying they're self-interested automatically, so all we need to do is shift them from, which I don't agree with, but I'll accept for, for the purpose okay. of this discussion. All you're asking them is to shift from a self-interested based on emotion or based on cognitive biases, yeah. to a self-interest that is based now on reason and rationality. And, I, you know, th that's a huge step forward if we can just get people oh, to yeah, do that. that. It, would, it would definitely be a good start, yeah. don't get me wrong. But, um, that's but, what morality is about. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I agree with that, that's the thing, because I, I don't think you can get away from being self-interested in some way. And if you're not making the choice, then I don't think it's moral, because I think morality requires you to make a choice. But, but the choice is to be rational. That is a choice. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily being moral. So put aside, is rationality a choice versus, so that, 
For some people. I mean, I would say for most people. Is anybody so, rational automatically? I don't think anybody's rational no, automatically. No, I think you probably have to work on it. Yeah, I think you have to work on yeah, it. Probably. I think it's a choice. So, so being rationally self-interested is a choice and therefore is, qualifies as morality. And then the alternative question I would have is, what then qualifies as morality? How do, how do you define morality I, I think, if you're taking self-interest out of the equation? The, the, the problem isn't uh, whether you're being emotionally or rationally self-interested. I think the problem I'm stumbling over is the fact that it's the self-interest part. As in, th this is something you, you don't have a choice in. Everyone has to be self-interested. Mother that Teresa person? was not self-interested. No, well, she hated her life. She I, suffered through it. If you I read her diary, she was depressed. I don't know enough about Mother Teresa, to be honest. You'd have to read Hitchens' I, uh, book I, about Mother I, Teresa. I would, he yeah. did a really good, really good book on Mother Teresa. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard not good things about her, actually. No, <laughs> she was an awful human being. And, and she really was. And, 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 and she was an awful human being to a large extent because she wasted her own life. Yeah. She suffered. She was miserable. She questioned the existence of God constantly because she was suffering and miserable and hated what she was doing. And then what she did to people, she took poor people and helped them not die. But then she would refuse to help them go beyond that yeah. because the meek shall inherit the earth. So the idea was you want to keep them poor, right? So, so you know, it's better to die. It's, yeah. it's horrible, the, 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 the idea. So he was a woman who was dedicated to her own destruction and the destruction of other people. And I think there are lots of people like that. That, that. that might just be something to do with Mother Teresa's own mental problems or something. I mean, I, I, like, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking for the, the sort of regular person, like, I just, I, I can't square it that something that I think people inevitably have to do, I mean, accepting Mother Teresa maybe, because I would say that's probably something wrong with her. Um, and from the sounds of it, it sounds like she was, she had yeah. problems. Yeah. But I, th I think the, um, the the problem is if if self interest really is something you have to do, then I couldn't consider forget self interest. Wanna, Rational oh, self interest, something it, you have it, to do. Any, any kind of self interest, I, I wouldn't be able to chalk that up as a moral decision. In the same way, I wouldn't be able to say going to sleep as a moral decision. Yeah, but again, you, because you, you're equivocating, right? So, so, so take away self-interest, put that aside, let's focus on the rational part of it. Yeah, but that's if the part you've, accepted, you've accepted that that's a choice. So, yeah. the, so the rational self-interest is a choice. Yeah. And, and therefore is within the realm of, of morality because it is a choice and you can live this way, being rational self-interest. You can live another way which is emotionally self-interest or you can live a third way which is sacrificing to other people, which, which again is a choice because you would mm -hmm. argue that they're automatically emotionally self-interested. Well, yeah, programmed I, to be I, I that. So Mother Teresa has to make a choice, maybe because she screwed up, to live a, an altruist, a truly altruistic yeah. life. And then what I'm saying is I want you to make a choice to be rational self-interest. And I think those choices are the essential characteristic of morality. Now, if you, if you choose to be rational self-interest, now there's a whole series of of kind of, if you will, virtues and values that that necessitates. So if you choose to be rational, then you have to be honest because honesty is an essential characteristic of rationality. You, you, you have to produce for yourself. And this, you know, this is really important in objectivism. You have to, because if, in, if, if you're living in reality, you have to be able to know that you can use your mind to feed yourself, to, to, to yeah, survive yeah, by yourself. So productiveness is a virtue. And, and, and then you want to be able to categorize people. These people are good people for me. These people are bad people for me. And that's the, that's the virtue of justice. Uh, you know, so, so you get the virtues in objectivism, the actual guides to action, from the idea of rationality as applied to my life, as applied to what will really, not emotionally and not in the moment, but what will really long term make my life the best life that it can be. Right, okay, that, yeah, okay, that's... I think that's where the, the difference in opinion comes from then, because I, I, it, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter whether you're choosing to be rationally self-interested or if you've just allowed your emotions to draw you into it. It's, it's the point of self-interest on which I have the problem, because, like I said, that's an essential characteristic of human beings that you, you really can't change. And, and even then, like, I'm not even sure if... The time. I'm not even sure if... Like, well, that's for self-interest too. It's better to be dead than to be suffering, and so the well, person... They could, they could choose not to be suffering. They're, they, I, you know, they're not I, living in a concentration camp. I think if they like, had that option, I, I they would. I understand it. Well, we all... I, I, think I mean, if, you, if you're... Middle-class kids in, a, in, a, in the suburbs have the option to choose a better life. I can understand committing suicide in, in a concentration camp, absolutely. Mm. But, but, but the fact is that people constantly choose to do things that are 
bad for them, that make their life miserable long term, that make their life horrible, that make their relationship yeah, they make with their life good in the short term. No, there is no, there is not that kind of. When I'm high really, on coke, I'm having a good time. You're high. <laughs> you, you know, there's a down that follows, right? Um, that's true, but that's the, yeah. that's the point. It's not, it's not always the best long term solution, but like. It's still something I did because I wanted to satisfy a particular self-interest at the time as I was going through it. This but, if it but if it causes you pain long-term, it can be in your short-term self-interest. It's not truly well, it, in your self-interest. It might be in your emotional desire. It might sure. be a whim, but it's not really good for you. Oh, I, I mean, self-interest I means good for me. Not, it, it, not emotionally pleasing for me. It means good for me. But this, this I think, is um, a sort of ideological definition rather than yeah. a more sort of, I guess, flat pack standard uh, perception of it because, sure. like, uh, I mean... It's a philosophical definition which is, does yeah. not accommodate regular use of the word. The regular I mean, use of the word, granted, but words change in meaning and Ayn Rand had a whole theory of how you define words and, and you know, as a philosopher, she had the responsibility of saying, well, wait a minute, is the common uses of the word self-interest or selfish right? And, and, and if self means at, at the core of it, taking care of self, then no, it, you know, your short-term pursuit of the cocaine is not taking care of yourself. And therefore that should be excluded from self-interest. So, but it's still, I'm, I'm, I'm one, I guess I'm bewildered at this point. Okay. What do you consider morality? What is morality? Um, Just as a few well, I, I, I mean, that's a good question. I'm not saying I have the answer. Okay. I'm um, curious how yeah, you hold it. Well, I mean, th this, this is the, I think this is, this is something I'll probably end up changing at some point in the future. Sure. Um, but I, I think that you can, you can separate it out into several things. Like, I mean, it, it is virtuous to act in your own self-interest and obey the laws, make other people's lives better, say through capitalism, you know, through, through fair trade, and to not hurt other people. And so you're not infringing on other people's lives. So why? <laughs> because you're, because, not to because you're not hurting other people. That's the thing, right? I mean, this. What, the, so where does that intrinsic value that other people have come from? Well, because then you expect the same consideration from them in return. And I agree, it comes from your own self-definition yep. of your own yep. welfare and yep. your own virtue and yep. your own yep. value. And I agree that, that people do that. But I'm, I'm just trying to I'm trying to get from the theory into reality. That's my problem. And uh, is anyone familiar with the mouse utopia experiment? Yeah, okay, I'll, for the people who aren't, I saw a few faces. Um, basically, it was an experiment. I can't give you the details off the top of my head. But basically, they provided um, a large closed environment that had... Um, one beer is, is, is all that <laughs> I can, thank you my self-interest can deal with. So they, Carl, on the other hand, can handle... I, 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 I can handle another one. Um, but yeah, so they, they, they provided a closed environment to, the, to a population of mice with uh, an unlimited amount of food and resources they needed to survive. And after however many generations, um, the mice had changed. Their behavior had changed. They weren't acting like mice. In fact, there was a class of mouse kind of emerged that they called the beautiful ones. And these mice didn't really socialize with other mice. They didn't breed. They didn't, you know, mate. They, di they didn't um, do anything for fun. They basically sat there all day preening themselves to, to make themselves look perfect. They, this is why they were called the beautiful ones. And... Objectivism looks, basically what the mice were living under was real communism. This is what the communists want at the end of capitalism, obviously. So no one's wanting for any resources, no one's needing anything. And th this is the, the final stage of communism that these mice were living in. And I think that essentially they had adopted this kind of rational self-interest ethic w without knowing it, obviously. But um, th this is basically, I think, the end state of morality for humans, when no human ever actually needs another human. But, but, but that's, that's completely upside down, right? Yeah. So um, it's essential for human happiness, for human flourishing, for human success to be productive. It's essential. Uh, only, only right now. I mean, no, not right now. No, right now. I mean, right now, we live in such a high standard of living that you don't need to be very productive to be able to survive, to be able to live. If you think about our lives today as compared to the lives of human beings 250 years ago, and for all of human history. Yeah, but that's just dis dis of degree. We need to do almost nothing today. I could live today 
at, at, I could work an hour a day and live better than my ancestors did, oh. right? And yet I choose to work like 12 hours a day, yeah. you know, like a maniac, right? Because I get so much of my self-esteem, so much of my, of my self-worth, so much of my passion and my interest from the work that I do. The same about other human oh, beings. Uh, we get so much benefit from our association, both spiritual and material through trade. Yeah. from associating with other, with, with other human beings. So the idea that the end of rational self-interest is, is sitting around in your room masturbating well, no, 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 no. Is, That's not is, what I'm saying. Uh, uh, what, what, no, no, no. Well, is, the thing is, just, the thing is, just, no, 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 well, the thing is, thing, right? what, what, what do you work on when there's nothing left to be worked on? The next thing to be worked on. There is no, Hum there is no such thing. Well, Human need is infinite. There is no, I, you know, I, I look, look at somebody like Elon you. Musk. Look at somebody like Elon Musk. He's worth a hundred billion dollars. I, I can't even imagine what that means to be worth a hundred billion dollars. What does he do? He works all day oh, yeah, yeah. and he's planning a space expl exploration company. Mm. He's pouring money into rocket ships that will take people to the Mars and stuff. There is no limit to human imagination. There's no limit to human... I, I'm not saying we're anywhere no near it now. To, no, never. There will never be. As long as we I, have I minds, I think that's probably there true. will never be an end to, to the kind of ideas that we have, the kind of artistic endeavors. For example, we have today more artists than ever in human history per capita basis. Why? Because, because we're rich, yeah. so we can afford to be entertained all the time. So, I mean, there's no end to how much but, of this stuff you can have. Yeah, I, 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 I agree, and, I, and that's, that's kind of why I couldn't be an objectivist, because while, while, while human beings need each other for anything, I think that um, sort of this sort of egoistic version of morality will, will never be as... Uh, uh, just, I don't think it's something that will ever be accepted because I think the whole point of morality is a way for human beings to bind with one another and actually form a reason to have relationships. I mean, I think an, a morality of egoism is the best bond human beings can have. I mean, I'd, I've been married 35 years, right? Mm -hmm. So I've bonded... <laughs> no, no. I, I'm joking. I, I, you know, my, my wife is amazing, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that bond is fantastic because we're both egoists. We, we both value our own lives, and we relate to one another as egoists. That is, I, the reason I stay with my wife is she provides me with immense pleasure, immense satisfaction, immense co contribution to my life. I have friends who I've had for many decades. Why? Because, and they're all egoists, right? I don't know if friends are not objectivists. Um, I mean, it's true. But because, and I don't have that many friends, but the friends that I have are really, really good friends. Why? Because we value each other for what we really are. Not for something fake. They don't expect me to sacrifice for them. Um, you know, we, we, but, but I think I have better friendships and better love relationships and... Uh, better relationships generally than most people because I'm an egoist. So I think it's the exact opposite. Well, I think if people really do. value human relationships, they will become egoistic because think about it. I mean, you don't marry somebody out of sacrifice. Well, I mean, a lot of people is do, not selfless. I, well, I, and then I, they get divorced the two years later as a consequence. Well, maybe. Nobody goes to their, to their loved one the night before they get married and say, you don't really do anything for me. This is completely selfless. I'm doing this as an act of major sacrifice. And if they did, they'd get slapped in the face and the wedding would be over. <laughs> thank God. Because, because, of course, the reason you get married with somebody is because the way they make you feel. And hopefully it's reciprocal. Otherwise, don't get married because it's a massive mistake. Yeah, I, I think you don't a do a fa You're not doing mistakes. a favor to others. I think people, look, people make massive mistakes in their lives. People do stupid things all the time. Again, morality is not about descriptive, it's about prescriptive. What I'm telling people is, don't get married for that reason. Yes, people get married for lots of awful reasons. Don't do it. If you value your life, here are the things you should look for when you get married. If you value your life, this is how to behave in these kind of circumstances. Morality is supposed to be a guide to action. Not a description of action, but a guide, a guidebook that tells you which, what is the right path, what is the wrong path? Marrying out of a sense of duty, marrying out of a sense of sacrifice, marrying out of a sense of self, self, uh, selflessness is the wrong path to take in life. That's the guidance objectivism gives. So where, where's the compulsion to help the needy then in objectivism? There is none. I mean, you, you shouldn't help the needy unless you find some reason to help them. Unless they help you. 
No, it's not a direct help to you. Oh, well, whatever. Uh, unless they unless somehow benefit your rational yeah. self-interest. So, so, for example, I, I love children. I love children. I love babies. I, you know, I, uh, I know people who say, you know, babies, you don't get anything out back from them. I, no, they're full of shit. They're full I, of shit. I, 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 love, I love babies. Yeah. Right? If you came to me in a, in a rational world, in the world today, I'm, I'm pretty cynical, but if you came to me in a rational world and said, you know, I'm starting up a charity to help babies that have been abandoned by their mothers or help cure cancer, I would like, I'd write you a big yeah. check, no problem, because I love, but if you came to me, there's some adult who, who, you know, who could work, but he's not really interested in working, he's just sleeping on the street, to hell with them. I, I have no motivation to help him. So now somebody else might say, I value X, I value Y, but, but each one of us would be good, and, and some people won't help anybody in terms of charity. I don't think charity is that important in life. Uh, I don't think helping the needy is that important in life. Uh, I don't think most people need help. I think 99.9% .9 of people could take care of themselves if we gave them an opportunity to do so and didn't institutionalize them through welfare into poverty. Uh, so well, on that we can agree. Yeah, yeah. So helping the needy is not to me a moral, it, it, it can be moral. But for the most part, most people help the needy out of a sense of guilt. And I don't feel guilty. I didn't do anything to cause oh, them I, to be... I, agree. To I, I don't think you should feel guilty because you see someone who has problems. But I, I, so, so if somebody came to me in my neighborhood and, and had a problem, and I would probably help them, and the reason I would probably help them is I have a very benevolent view of human, of, of human beings because I know what's possible. Right? People work out there, people are working out there and making my life, I mean, I think those Chinese workers who make this stuff is so cool. Never mind the engineers that actually design it, never mind the chip made. I mean, people are amazing creatures, oh, yeah. amazing creatures. So if some stranger comes to me and says, look, I'm, I'm really falling on hard times, I would be happy to help them under the assumption that they have the potential, right? If, if I know somebody is a bastard, I mean, oh, yeah, bastard, and I'm not going to help. help. Like that, yeah. Exactly. So you're being self-interested. I'm being self-interested, but I know well, actually, a lot. Actually, I'm more interested in the bastard. <laughs> well, yeah, you, fuck it, that guy. Yeah, fuck that yeah. guy. Exactly. Yeah. But I know a lot of people would help the bastard out of a sense of guilt. See, out of a sense, yeah, I agree. Lots of people do that. Lots of people do that. So again, what I'm saying is, prescription, right? You should not help the bastard. Only help good people, or at least people you don't know anything about. Right, so give them the benefit of the doubt. But if you know somebody's a bad guy, right, he's a member of Antifa or something, <laughs> don't help them. Don't help them. Don't give them any assistance ever, right? So be selfish. If somebody's going to harm you, then it's insane to help them. Now, somebody might not immediately help you, but in the grand scheme of things, they're a human being, and human beings are good. Look, we take care of our plants. Yeah. We take care of our pets. Yep. To me, any human being, almost any human being, who hasn't done me any harm, is more valuable than a pet, right? I'm not oh, big yeah, on dogs yeah, and no, cats. No, so I'm happy to help people. The <laughs> idea that objectivists are not going to help people is bizarre. On the contrary, we're some of the most benevolent, friendly, nicest people in the world because we value ourselves. And if we project on other people, wow, they're living the kind of life I'm living. You know, how wonderful is that? Right, okay. Okay, that, that's very interesting, and I guess we can leave it there. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Hey. Well, I, I guess we uh, can take some questions. Sure, let's take some questions. Go. I'll let, I'll let you uh, uh, yeah, manage you wanna, it. Uh, can someone pass that across? Because we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll need to share the mic. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Uh, what do you do with, uh, so the question is, what do you do with people that got to some problems in life outside of their capacity, outside of their limits of actions, and they get into massive depression, that they get into internal problems, uh, or they get cancer, they get things that are beyond his repair. Uh, what would be the, the way, to, should we help them? That's the first question. And the second one is, what's, what's the best way to take those people out of those internal problems, so they could be libertarians, objectivists, anarchists, no, not, not the kind of anarchist, like anarcho-capitalists, yeah. Yeah, but how, how do you help those people? Yeah, yeah. We have to go back and forth. Uh, I mean, I would say that that, uh, that is the role of psychology. I mean, a, a healthy psychology, a real science of psychology, would be to help people like that regain their values, regain their perspective, regain their rationality, 
put them on the right track and help in that way. The question is, would you help them? Again, it depends. If it's a basically good human being and, and I don't know, they lost their job and they got depressed and things deteriorated, I would be, yeah, I would be happy to help them, particularly if they started on the right track. That is, if they, if they committed to going to see a psychologist or doing group, you know, if group therapy works, I don't know. But whatever thing that works. So, you know, you know people who are addicted to stuff and if they are really, truly dedicated to getting off of it, I'm happy to help. If they're not, then I'm not going to help them. Right? Um, I, I, I guess you're asking about um, welfare and universal health care and things like that, really, aren't you? Yeah. No? <laughs> Do, I was in I a, you will die. Well, well, I mean, it, I, well, the, the, this is the thing. I mean, the question is who's going to help them, isn't it? That's... You're asking a more broader political question. Yeah, so I mean, th th this, this is incidentally why I'm okay with a social safety net and universal health care. Um, it means that there is at least something that is guaranteed to be there to help them. But, um, I mean, yeah, I, obviously I think people who have fallen on hard times and are down on their luck. I mean, the only charity I actually do is giving money to homeless people. But then I know that they've had the money they needed it, and I don't trust charities, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine with the social safety net. I think that one of the things that I find interesting about objectivists is the, the, the role of government is generally described to me as the, the only domain that government can have a, a role in is in the use of force. And uh, I'm characterizing that correctly. Um, I'm, I actually, I don't see why the government can't do other things. I mean, who's going to build the roads, I guess, is the, uh, the question. Yeah, answer that one. I mean... <laughs> I mean, I mean, the reason we object to government doing other things, including building the roads, is the only way for them to do that is to use force. So what I object is, is to anybody, anybody, an individual or a group, taking my money without asking, right? So, so using coercion against me. So it's, it's, it, I find it fascinating that if you, if you came to me and said, I, I need help, and I said, yeah, I can't help you right now, and you pulled a gun and took my money, that would be stealing. Everybody in society would accept those stealing, go to jail, we don't accept it. But if you got everybody to vote to take my money, that's okay. Anything that's immoral for an individual human being to do is immoral for a group to do. Well, no, that's, so, that's the point of government, though, isn't it? I mean, that's, we we, we no. imbue the government with powers that no, no one individual can have. No, but that's immoral. That's the essence of immorality. The essence of immorality. So Socrates is corrupting the youth just as we try to do at King's College. And, and, well, course, and, yeah. Yes, right? And, and the group government decided that he was that it was a bad thing and they killed him right and so and that's not right well, I agree that so so not. why is it right to take my money because you decide that the group decides that my money it should be taken away from me no you live in a society which is an implicit consent to it's not implicit because nobody asked me I nobody asked me yeah, I do not want to give my money out yeah, but you I, don't leave. otherwise you'd have to leave where would I leave to I mean, no, I have, a right to I have a right to live wherever I see fit without people using force against me. That is the essence of, of human life in a society together. That we, uh, the, the, see, the point objectivism makes is the agreement we make when we live in society is not we'll use force whenever we have enough votes to use it. The essence of the agreement we make when we live in a society is that force will never be used against another human being. In, 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 no, not arbitrarily, not arbitrarily, in, in initiation. So if somebody doesn't want to do something, I would never force them to do it. I never mean, force them to do it. Mean, like, for example, um, if someone is just refusing to follow the laws, then force, uh, sorry, force has to be initiated against them to make them follow the laws. Well, but it, the law it, isn't necessarily against violence. They still have to have force initiated against them yes. in order to follow the, you know, to, they have to, people that's have to because be we, following laws. No, because we live in a, we live in a corrupt society. We live in a society well, in which laws are not. No, society is there only as a government to have laws that protect us from violence. There should be no other laws. There should be no other laws. So, so I would say not only is, is something like welfare destructive to, to the person, to me, 
because money is being taken away from me without my consent, which I, I view as incredibly destructive. It's taking my life, it's taking my time, it's taking my effort without my consent. But I also think it's destructive to the person receiving it because I think that they are being told, here's a check, don't think, don't produce, don't be rationally self-interest, don't pursue your life, we'll take care of you, you're too stupid to do it yourself, which I don't think 99.9% .9 of people are. And the same with healthcare. I think not only by universalizing healthcare am I getting an inferior product, I mean a dramatically inferior product to what the marketplace could provide, um, but, but we're all getting an inferior product. And, for, and, and, and then what we're telling doctors is you have to accept this amount of money for this treatment. You don't have any other options. So we're enslaving the doctor and the nurse and the entire medical profession because we believe that it is an essential good. Well, so is agriculture. Why don't we, why don't we, so is food, why don't we nationalize all food production in the world, right? Food is more important than health. Well, if you don't have food, you're doing with the social safety net, isn't it, with the welfare state? Well, it's what they did in Venezuela, and now everybody's starving. Well, what, what I mean is that they're making sure that, I mean, if the argument is everyone is entitled to X, then having a social safety net yeah. is to provide yes. that X. And my argument is nobody's entitled to anything, and, uh, unless you produce it, and then if you want something that you don't have, ask for it. I mean, if my neighbor came to me and said, look, my son needs a, an emergency procedure, I don't have enough money right now, could you help me out? I'm more than likely happy to write him a check and, and help him out. But if he comes with a gun at me, if he, come, if he gets the neighborhood to come at me to provide that health care, that's just morally offensive. People ask, it's morally wrong. Running the purpose of the, 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 the state itself. I mean, the, the state has to be imbued with powers that no one individual can have. Otherwise, you're going to have people being the judge in their own trial and things like this. So we have to, we have to provide the state with... Yeah, so there's one, there's one issue which we have to give to the state because we can't handle it. This is why I'm against anarchy, right? The, 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 there's one issue that you have to extract for society so that markets can emerge and voluntary yeah, trade yeah, yeah. can emerge, and that's force. Yeah, and that's the one good. thing that we have to imbue government with, with protection. It has to be the agency that protects us from frauds and criminals and gangsters and terrorists. Yeah, but that, 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 that's a principled argument. They're making a pragmatic argument. For example, it's going to be cheaper and easier if we just have... Uh, nationalized roads and then pay a small road tax? No, it turns out exactly the opposite. You think so? Absolutely, no question. Really? Particularly today with modern technology, we could have a GPS, uh, you could have a GPS on your car that, that told you exactly which roads and who you have to pay. It could be so cool. I and and the, the owners of the road would take care of the roads so much better and they'd be building new tunnels and new things which, which today government couldn't even imagine to do. Our means of transportation would be a hundred years more advanced if we privatized the roads. Well, the first, the, who built the railroads in, in, in England? It wasn't government. Oh, it was Brunel. Yeah, it was, it was, it was private enterprise. Who, built the, who, who dug the first canals in, in the United States to transport goods from one place to but another? It becomes, it becomes all private enterprise to more people more often to have these things nationalized. I mean, like, for example, I don't want to have to go through a toll every time I change road. You know? Yeah, but you are going, you know, as a consequence of that, you're getting a, a, a tax system and a whole infrastructure that is massively inefficient in order to fund that yeah, but road. But it means I pay less anyway, because, I mean, if I have to pay a toll on every road, I may as well pay a small you would, amount overall. You wouldn't have to pay a toll on every road. I, I mean, the, the, the idea of privatizing road, I mean, there'd be books written about it. it it's, I mean, there it's, are private roads, and you have to pay a toll to go. Yes, yeah, some private roads you'd have to pay a toll on. Some private roads you wouldn't have to pay a toll on, depending on, on why the road was built and who, who is actually managing the road. Uh, you, you could imagine uh, trade associations building roads to get you to the shopping mall because they have a strong incentive for you to oh, cover, yeah. travel to the shopping mall. You can imagine insurance companies building roads for you to drive because they want to sell you car insurance. You can imagine, I mean, the only thing missing from, imag from imagining how private markets and roads, and roads are the last thing oh, to yeah, be yeah, privatized. Yeah, yeah. The only thing limiting <laughs> is, is our imagination. Yeah. And I always say people ask me things like, well, how would the market deal with problem X? And my answer is usually, I don't know. But my experience with markets is mm. that they will always come up with a better answer than anything I could imagine. Because if I could imagine those good answers, I would be a billionaire today because I would have either done it or invested in it. But I can't imagine, you know, if, if the government can't build Yeah, I wouldn't want the government to build my phone. <laughs> but, but roads are fine, right? And healthcare, which is it, far more sophisticated than, than this, far more difficult, far more important, 
far more valuable. I certainly don't want them to do. And education, which I view as the most important product produced by, by in society, that is the last thing I want government to touch. Yeah, but it's, I think it's more about just convenience rather than, uh, rather than innovation in that regard. Some, something that is perfectly, func perfectly functional as it is, like a road. It doesn't need any particular innovation. We just need them done effectively and maintained well across the country. I'm happy to let government do that. I, I, I saw what happened in this country last week when it snowed a little bit. Okay, yeah. no, a little, a, a little that, bit. That's a British um, problem. That's a <laughs> it's not a British problem. But it wouldn't happen if somebody had an economic incentive around those roads. If somebody had a self-interested incentive about keeping those roads clear, I mean, they wouldn't happen. Company. Yeah, it's so, so snow is, is unusual and yeah. rare. But, uh, but the thing that we're missing is what, what is possible, and I don't have an answer of what is possible because, again, I would make a lot of money if I did. What is possible to transport human beings from point A to point B if we privatize that problem? If we said to, to, to the marketplace, you get to innovate well, the marketplace with regard to transportation of point A to point B. It doesn't. Everything, everything regarding that transportation from the road to the mechanism by which we use train, uh, automobile is regulated in mutual. Well, yeah, I'm not saying they're not regulated, but they're still, it's still a market. It's just a regulated market. Isn't it? And, and, and its, its foundation, the road, is owned by the government. Yes. So it's like, it's like money. It's like you don't get innovation in money with the exception of But that's not saying you can't create a new foundation privately, like with the trains. Well, of course you can because, uh, because the government won't let you, right? And the trains, once the government nationalized them and then privatized them and nationalized, you know, privatized Yeah, I don't like the way it's it, it, all, it, all, it all disappears. Yes, originally... In a, in a beginning state, you could create something new and then they take it from you because it's a public utility. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, should we go for another question? Yeah, sure. You choose. Oh, well, the, go, the lady. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Whoever gets up. I have a slight weird question. Would, uh, I have a weird question. <laughs> Would you be in favor of giving people a choice uh, to um, let's say get a card that will allow them to not to pay any taxes whatsoever and not be able, thanks to not paying taxes, not to receive any, uh, any uh, social services at all. Interesting question. Could, could they drive on the roads? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a right? legitimate question. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a legitimate question. So what does it mean not to get social services? Yeah. It, it, you know, so yes, generally, I would like, I, I, I would be in favor of that as, as an option because I, I would certainly take advantage of that option. And I'm actually doing it right now. I don't know if you guys know, but I've moved to Puerto Rico. And by moving to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is the only place on the planet for an American citizen to move where you can pay almost no taxes. So I am today in the, in the really unique position where I'm paying very little taxes. And granted, the services in Puerto Rico are not that great, right? So I'm not getting a lot in return. I've given up, I haven't given up my American citizenship, but I've given up all the goodies that I would get in California. Um, I, I would pref so I, I think that would be an interesting option, but you'd have to define what government services are. Because, you know, well, yeah, yeah, assuming it's all categorized and, you know, they, I, I mean, I personally would have no problem with that, to be honest. I'm, Believe honestly, me, it sounds like quite a good happen. idea. It's as likely to happen as the elimination of those services. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Because, because the status would never allow it. Would never allow giving people to follow. I imagine Jeremy Corbyn being like, yeah, okay, I'll be fine with that. The <laughs> hell he would. Yeah. You know? yeah, I mean, even in, in America today, you can't opt out of Social Security. I, I, I would opt out tomorrow from Social Security. I don't need that money. You know, be safe for me. I can save for myself, right? But nobody's going to allow you to opt out of Social Security. Now, in Chile... This is, a, this is a real fascinating experiment. In Chile, they allowed, what they did was they created a private track where you could invest in, in, in mutual funds and had money managers and so on. And they gave people an option. You can stay with the government plan, the Social Security government plan, no changes to it, or you can take the same amount you would have given the government and put it into this private set of funds. Now, still not my ideal. My ideal is government doesn't dictate your saving to you at all, but better than the system of just giving it to government. 99% of Chilean, Chileans, including the socialists, have moved their money out of government programs and into the private sector. Yeah, but is it because the government program was not final salary? Was it the final salary program? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And still they chose the... Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
because they realized that they, would, they could do a lot better. I know, so, so, so Social Security in America, you get a specific sum. It's guaranteed for you. Okay. But the fact is that, that, that even with a, with a moderate level of investing, I would make a lot better just by buying an index fund and going to sleep at night and not thinking about it. And everybody could. Just putting it actually in a saving account at a bank, even at the low interest rates that we have today, you would do better than, than the return that the government promises you. And they're still going bankrupt in spite of that. Right, okay. Should we give uh, one more question? Um, let's give the gentleman. So, does the government grant us rights, or are we born with rights? We have rights inherently. The purpose of a government is to protect those rights. Anyone in disagreement? No, I, I mean, I would just add from where we get those rights. We get those rights from our nature, and, and, and we get those rights from our nature as rational beings. If we were not rational beings, we would have no rights. R rights are the recognition. That, and this goes to the nature of government, and you can't get to the nature of government without going through rights. Rights are the recognition that in order to s thrive as human beings, we must use our mind. And that the enemy of the mind, the enemy of reason, is force. And therefore, when we are together, when we are in a social context, we must eradicate force from human activity so that each one of us can, can act free of coercion, can pursue whatever values, including your short-term self-interest values, whatever values you want, free of coercion. And that means free of coercion, even when, you know, so, so if the government is there just to protect our rights, right, then how can it, how can it violate our rights? And, and when it takes money from me, it's violating my rights. It's using coercion against me. The whole point of rights is the elimination of coercion. That is the essential. Coercion and authority and, and a gun. Is, is, is that is what rights wipe out. And when we let it back in through the government, we're violating rights. And of course the founders of America understood this, and that's why they said the biggest violator of rights in human history is government. And therefore we have to limit government, we have to constrain government, we have to create separation of powers, we have to make government as weak as possible so that they won't be tempted to violate our rights. Didn't help. <laughs> okay, well... Thank you very much. Yeah, that was okay. fun. You're welcome.